Welcome to the Recommended Daily Value Podcast, your daily dose into the health and wellness world. Welcome back to the Recommended Daily Value Podcast, where we dive into everything health, fitness, and nutrition related five days a week in five minutes or less. This podcast is brought to you by Umzu, and I'm your host, Tyler Woodward. Today, we're reviewing one of my all-time favorite books, The Biology of Belief by Bruce H. Lipton, Ph.D., Most of the books I review on here I do recommend because I'm not particularly picky and I read a lot, but this one I really, really recommend. And the reason for this being that this book really opened my eyes to the mechanistic view of biology today. This episode is building off the last episode, The Story of the Cell, which are both based on Bruce H. Lipton's PhD's book, The Biology of Belief. Lipton discusses how much of biology today is based on what is known as the central dogma of biology, which is the perspective biology occurs in a single pathway consisting of DNA to RNA to proteins. A lot of biology is based on the Darwinian view of evolution, which has become termed survival of the fittest or evolution by natural selection. This is basically the concept that the strongest survive. Here's a famous example. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the majority of mollusks in Great Britain were all white and blended in with white trees, which provided them with camouflage from their predators, birds. During the Industrial Revolution, due to smoke and soot, the trees in Great Britain turned black. This provided a huge evolutionary advantage to the small portion of the black moths already present in the moth population as they now blended into the trees, whereas the white moths now stood out. Over time, the black moth population skyrocketed as the white moth population significantly declined because they were now at the disadvantage. This is a prime example of evolution by natural selection. There is an environmental pressure favoring a specific trait, resulting in this trait being selected for over time. But there's another evolutionary theory that has largely been discredited until recently, and that is Lamarck's theory of use and disuse, which is the idea that organisms alter their behavior towards environmental change. There's lots of examples that are commonly used to discredit Lamarck's work. For example, saying giraffes will continually grow taller with each passing generation as they continue to stretch their necks, reaching for taller and taller leaves and taller and taller trees. A more scientific example, which is honestly just horrible science, that Lipton mentioned was proposed by German scientist August Weissmann who cut off the tails of mice and bred them together, stating that if Lamarck's theory was correct, the offspring should be born without tails. This obviously never happened, but it's completely malarkey to discredit Lamarck off of these ideas or experiments. When truly considered, Lamarck's ideas are much more elegant in my opinion. As we discussed in the last episode, when you view evolution on the macro scale, these massive changes that have occurred don't make much sense. But when you view things on the cellular level, it's much easier to connect these dots. Like we talked about last episode, we are just the sum of our cells, and our cells are responsible for literally everything we do, whether it be sprinting, lifting, jumping, talking, whatever. So here's a more plausible example for Lamarck's theory. I'm not the most well-versed in epigenetics, so cut me a little slack, but here goes. To get as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger, you need a lot of muscle. To make a lot of muscle, you need certain genes to turn on to produce certain proteins. And if you're not aware, there's a constant turnover in virtually everything in our body, proteins included. So proteins are always being broken down and then rebuilt. In order to maintain such high amounts of muscle mass, you would need these genes that build muscle to remain on a lot more of the time compared to the average person. This is part of what is known as epigenetics. And while I don't think Arnold's kid is going to come out yoked, they may have an easier time gaining and retaining larger amounts of muscle compared to the everyday Joe. Passes down for generations and you really don't know what will happen. The large focus of Lamarck's work is that nurture is the key, not nature. The environment will dictate how both the cells and the organism responds. In this case, the stressors of the environment are weightlifting or resistance training, which results in lots of muscle mass. But we also know this is true in other ways. Feed a mouse or even humans really difficult to digest foods and their digestive tracts will lengthen. Feed them really easy to digest foods and their digestive tracts will shorten due to the decreased digestive burden or less energy needed to digest their food. Our environment dictates both who we are and what we become. We all know if you're starved for food, you won't develop properly. If you never try to learn, you'll never see your full capacity for intelligence. Some more fun examples can be found with the placebo effect, which I'll give you an example straight from the book. A Baylor School of Medicine study published in 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine evaluated surgery for patients with severe debilitating knee pain, Mosley et al., 2002. The lead author of the study, Dr. Bruce Mosley, knew, quote-unquote, that knee surgery helped his patients. Quote-unquote, all good surgeons know there is no placebo effect in surgery. But Mosley was trying to figure out which part of the surgery was giving his patients relief. Patients in the study were divided into three groups. Mosley shaved the damaged cartilage in the knee of one group. For another group, he flushed out the knee joint, removing material thought to be causing the inflammatory effect. Both of these constitute standard treatment for arthritic knees. The third got fake surgery. 
The patient was sedated. Mosley made three standard incisions and then talked and acted just as he would have during a real surgery. He even splashed salt water to stimulate the sound of the knee washing procedure. After 40 minutes, Mosley sewed up the incisions as if he had done the surgery. All three groups prescribed the same postoperative care, which included an exercise program. The results were shocking. Yes, the groups who received surgery, as expected, improved. But the placebo group improved just as much as the other two groups. Despite the fact that there are 650,000 surgeries yearly for arthritic knees at a cost of about $5,000 each, the results were clear to Mosley. Quote, unquote, my skill as a surgeon had no benefit on these patients. The entire benefit of surgery for osteoarthritis on the knee was the placebo effect. The placebo patients didn't find out for two years they had gotten fake surgery. One member of the placebo group, Tim Perez, who had to walk with a cane before the surgery, is now able to play basketball with his grandchildren. He summed up the theme of this book when he told the Discovery Health Channel, In this world, anything is possible when you put your mind to it. I know that your mind can work miracles. The difference between us and individual cells is that we have the capacity to change our environment. Whether it's consuming high-quality food, finding work that's truly enriching, or surrounding yourself with good people, we have the capacity to change our environment. The Biology of Belief is, in my opinion, a book about how we control our own destiny and our own happiness. Well, that's it for this episode, so definitely go check this book out. I highly recommend it. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit that subscribe button and to share it with a friend. And remember, these opinions are my own, based on my own research and experiences, and it's not medical advice. Until next time, be good.